हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल सिंपली मेडिक्स प्लीज लाइक सब्सक्राइब एंड शेयर सो नाउ वील डिस्कस द थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द चैप्टर दैट इज द बेसिक फार्माकोलॉजी ऑफ द डायरेटिक एजेंट्स सो द रियल गेम बिगिन्स फ्रॉम हियर इफ यू हैव अंडरस्टूड द प्रीवियस पार्ट वेरी वेल दिन दिस पार्ट विल बिकम वेरी इजी टू अंडरस्टैंड वी कैन क्लासीफाई द डायरेटिक्स इन टू सिक्स क्लासेस कार्बोनिक एनहाइड्रेस इनहिबिटर्स एस जी एल टी टू इनहिबिटर्स लूप डायरेटिक्स थाइड्स पोटेशियम स्पेरिंग डायरेटिक्स एंड ऑस्मोटिक डायरेटिक्स विच ऑल्टर द वॉटर एक्सक्रीशन ऑल्सो नोन एज एक्वाटिक्स द प्रोटोटिपिकल सी ए इनिबिटर इज एसिटाजोलामाइड एंड द एस जी एल टी टू इनिबिटर्स इंक्लूड डापाग्लिफ्लोजिन कैनाग्लिफ्लोजिन इम्पाग्लिफ्लोजिन एंड इप्राग्लिफ्लोजिन we can memorize the drug these drugs with a mnemonic desi drugs and the loop diuretics includes furosemide ethacranic acid bumetanide and torsemide these two are sulfonamide based drugs we can remember this with the mnemonic better future b for bumetanide e for ethacranic acid torsemide and future is for furosemide the thiazides include so many drugs but the most important drugs which we have to remember are hydrochlorothiazide hydroflumethiazide and benzthiazide and some and some thiazide like drugs which also block the sodium chloride co-transporter are chlorthalidone metolazone and clopamide etc and now the potassium sparing diuretic which prevents the potassium secretion this can be either aldosterone antagonist spironolactone and eplerenone or this can include uh, sodium channel blocker also amiloride triamtrin we can remember these drugs with a mnemonic seat and the osmotic diuretics include mannitol isosorbide and glycerol so let's discuss these these drugs one by one with their pharmacokinetics pharmacodynamics clinical indication adverse effects and contraindications ca inhibitors that is acetazolamide inhibit the carbonic anhydrase enzyme which blunt the sodium bicarbonate reabsorption if we talk about pharmacokinetic route of administration is oral its effects are persist for 12 hours and excretion is by pct talking about pharmacodynamics it depresses the bicarbonate ion reabsorption in the pct that is here so this will not be reabsorbed so what will happen it will accumulate in the lumen which will increase the negative charge inside the lumen to compensate this chloride ion reabsorption will be increased so what will happen it will lead to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that is increased level of chloride ion in the blood which will reduce the ph of the blood in high doses one more important thing about acetazolamide to remember is that its efficacy decreases with use over several days now talking about they are clinical indications acetazolamide can be used in glaucoma to reduce the formation of aqueous humor it can also be used for urinary alkalinization in cystinuria when ph of urine will in, will increase by acetazolamide then the solubility of cysteine will also increased it can also be used in metabolic alkalosis metabolic alkalosis is generally treated treated by correction of abnormalities in total body potassium intravascular wall or mineralocorticoid levels however when the alkalosis is due to the excessive use of diuretics in patients with severe heart failure replacement of intravascular volume may be contraindicated in these cases acetazolamide can be useful in correcting the alkalosis as well as producing a small additional diuresis for correction of volume overload it can also be used in acute mountain sickness Acetoz acetazolamide 
used in this case to decrease the formation of CSF and to decrease the pH of CSF in the brain. Its adverse effects are hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, renal stones formation, renal potassium wasting and the other side effects include drowsiness, paresthesias, renal failure, nervous system toxicity and hypersensitivity. Acetazolamide is contraindicated in patients of cirrhosis because alkalinization of urine decreases the u urinary excretion of NH4 plus ion and may contribute to the, the development of hyperammonemia and hepatic encephalopathy. Now let's talk about SGLT2 inhibitors. Talking about pharmacokinetics, these are oral drugs mostly ex excreted in the form of metabolites. Talking about pharmacodynamics as their name, they inhibit sodium glucose transporter 2. Here, so what will happen? Glucose will increase in lumen and the excretion of glucose will be more. That's why it acts similar to other oral hypoglycemic agents. So talking about their clinical indications and their adverse reactions. They reduces the hemoglobin A1c by 0.5 to 1%. These drugs can result in weight loss and also can induce the drop in systolic blood pressure. They can increase the urine volume. They can cause acute kidney, kidney injury. So now let us discuss about the loop diuretics. Talking about pharmacokinetics, they are rapidly absorbed, eliminated by kidney. Their secretion can be reduced by simultaneous administration of NSAIDs or probenicid. Talking about their pharmacodynamics, as we already know that they inhibit sodium potassium chloride transporter in the thick ascending limb of Henle's loop. So as we have discussed earlier, if this channel will be blocked, then there will be no potassium accumulation and no increase in positive potential in lumen. So there will be no paracellular transportation of magnesium and calcium ion. So talking about their uses, they are used in hyperkalemia, can also be used in acute renal failure and can also be used in an ion overdose. So talking about their adverse effects, their hydrosis can cause hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. They can also cause ototoxicity which means hearing loss. This ototoxicity can also be caused by aminoglycoside antibiotics. They can also lead to hyperuricemia and hypomagnesemia. They can also cause allergic reactions. Their other side effects are dehydration, hyponatremia, hypercalciuria, thiamine deficiency in patients with heart failure. They are contraindicated in hepatic cirrhosis, borderline renal, renal failure or heart failure. So now we will discuss about the thiazides. They can be administered orally but the metabolism of all the thiazides are not same. They are secreted by the organic acid secretory system in PCT. So talking about their pharmacodynamics, as we have discussed earlier that the thiazides inhibit the NaCLV absorption from the luminal side of the epithelial cell in the DCT by blocking NaCL transporter or NCC. Thiazides increases the calcium ion reabsorption. This enhancement in calcium results from both PCT and DCT. In PC PCT, thiazide induced volume depletion leads to enhanced sodium and passive calcium reabsorption and in DCT they block NCC. So what happens that the sodium chloride absorption will be decreased which will result in enhancement in the calcium sodium exchange in the basolateral membrane which will result in more absorption of calcium. So now talking about their uses, they are used in hypertension, heart failure, nephrolithiasis due to hypercalciuria and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So talking about their adverse effects, their high do doses can lead to hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis and impaired carbohydrate tolerance. They can also cause hyponatremia, impaired uric acid metabolism and gout. They can also cause hyperlipidemia and allergic reactions. Their contraindications are same as the loop diuretics. So now let's talk about potassium sparing diuretics. So talking about their pharmacodynamics, they reduce the sodium absorption in the collecting tubules. As we have discussed earlier in collecting tubules that the sodium potassium absorption and potassium secretion are regulated by the aldosterone. The aldosterone antagonist interfere with this process. Similar effects are observed with respect to the hydrogen handling by the intercalated cells which explains the metabolic acidosis seen with aldosterone antagonists. The amyloride and triamtrine do not block aldosterone but instead they directly interfere with the this epithelium sodium channel in the apical membrane. Since this, pot, this potassium secretion so, sodium entry 
both are coupled in the collecting tube so the sodium channel blockers are also effective potassium sparing diuretics the action of aldosterone antagonists depends on the renal prostaglandin secretion so their action can be inhibited by enzymes so further let's just let's discuss about their uses they are most useful in states of minerallo mineralocorticoids excess that is hyperaldosteronism in cons syndrome and also in ectopic adrenocorticotropic hormone production or can also be used in secondary hyperaldosteronism evoked by heart failure hepatic cirrhosis and uh, nephrotic syndrome a very rare syndrome liddles syndrome which is a autosomal dominant disorder that results in activation of sodium channels in the cortical collecting ducts causing increased sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion by the kidneys the amyloride has shown its benefit in this condition amyloride is also used in the condition of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus their adverse effects include hyperkalemia hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis gynecomastia acute renal failure and kidney stones have also been reported they are contraindicated in chronic renal insufficiency and in the patients with liver disease so now let's talk about the agents that alter the water excretion the osmotic diuretics the prototype osmotic diuretic is mannitol so talking about their pharmacokinetics mannitol is poorly absorbed by the gi tract and when administered orally it causes osmotic diarrhea rather than diuresis so for systemic effect mannitol must be given intravenously mannitol is not metabolized and is excreted in glomerular filtration within 30 to 60 minutes without any important tubular reabsorption or secretion it must be used cautiously in patients with even mild renal insufficiency so talking about their pharmacodynamics osmotic diuretics have their major effect in the proximal tubule and the descending limb of henle's loop through osmotic effects they also oppose the action of adh in the collecting tubule they increase the urine volume by preventing the normal absorption of water the increase in urine flow decreases the contact time between fluid and the tubular epithelium thus reducing the sodium and water reabsorption the resulting natriuresis is of lesser magnitude than the water diuresis leading eventually to excessive water loss and hypernatremia they are used in reduction of intracranial and intraocular pressure their adverse effects are extracellular volume expansion dehydration hyperkalemia and hypernatremia they can also lead to hyponatremia when used in patients with severe renal impairment intravenously administered mannitol cannot be excreted and is retained in the blood this causes the osmotic extraction of water from the cells leading to hyponatremia without a decrease in the serum osmolality and the acute renal failure has also been reported so with this we have completed our third part of discussion so now we are going to discuss the fourth part of our discussion the clinical pharmacology of diuretics sometimes the short notes are asked from these topics so first we will discuss the edematous states then we will discuss about the non edematous states this include the discussion of heart failure kidney disease and renal failure failure hepatic cirrhosis and idiopathic edema and this include the discussion of hypertension nephrolithiasis hypercalcemia diabetes insipidus and renal and cardiac production edema associated with heart failure is generally managed with loop diuretics sometimes salt and water retention may become so severe that 
a combination of thiazides and loop diuretics are necessary excessive use of diuretics may impair the cardiac certain form of renal disease particularly diabetic nephropathy are frequently associated with the development of hyperkalemia at a relatively early stage of renal failure in these cases loop diuretics or thiazides can be used then let's talk about the hepatic cirrhosis liver disease is often associated with edema and ascites in conjunction with elevated portal hydrostatic pressure and reduced plasma oncotic pressures in these cases retention of sodium takes place due to diminished renal perfusion or maybe due to increased aldosterone level in plasma in severe cases we use the diuretic agents however cirrhotic patients are uh, resistant to loop diuretics but in severe cases the combination of uh, loop diuretics and aldosterone antagonist can be used but a considerable caution is very necessary talking about idiopathic edema spironolactone can be used now moving towards the non edematous state we are going to discuss the hypertension the diuretic and uh, mild vasodilator action of the thiazides are useful in treating virtually all patients with essential hypertension so talking about nephrolysis in this this case also the thiazides are used fluid intake should be increased and the salt intake must be reduced so talking about the hypercalcemia loop diuretics are used with the simultaneous administration of saline and when we talk about uh, diabetes insipidus thiazides can be used to reduce the polydipsia and polyuria but the administration of supplementary adh is the drug of choice in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus now let's talk about renal and cardiac protection aldosterone antagonists have been shown to be cardiac protective in patients with heart disease they may exert an additional benefit in lowering the albuminuria in the patients of diabetes and microalbuminuria so with this we have finished the last part of our discussion thank you so much for watching our video on the diuretics if you liked our video then please share and subscribe our channel simply medics for more videos and please click on the bell icon to get notification of new videos and if you have any doubts and for feedback please let us know in the comment thank you